The following interview was conducted with Daniel W. Halpin, Professor Emeritus of Civil Engineering and Bowen Head Division of Construction Engineering and Management for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, December 2, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Thank you and welcome. Uh, let's start off, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay, uh, um, I'm a native of Northern Kentucky. I was born in uh, Covington, Kentucky. Okay. Uh, uh, which of course is close to where I live presently. I'm in, I live in Crestview Hills, Kentucky. I was born on uh, 29 September 1938. And my mother's uh, maiden name was Moore. Her name was Gladys Evelyn Moore. Uh, <clears throat> and she married my father, uh, Jordan. It was his first name, Jordan William Halpin. And uh, so siblings, uh, there was a, I had an older brother who died as a, a baby, actually, before I was born. So uh -huh. uh, in effect, I was an only child. Uh, okay. What was great? What was early? Uh, talk about grade school and high school. Uh, a little bit about that. Okay, my uh, early years in, uh, was within the Covington uh, or Kenton County uh, school system, and I uh, I first attended uh, third district school, which was uh, I walked back and forth to uh, from my home. I lived on the West Eighth Street in Covington, uh -huh. <coughs> and. Uh, now, one of my memories about my first day at Third District, I went to kindergarten over the first several weeks of my time there, uh, was that uh, I, I was very concerned because I thought I'd gotten a low grade on the first test that we had in kindergarten. And it oh turned out the first test that we had was reading an eye chart. Oh, and no. there were some other people that read the chart better than I could because uh, apparently they had better eyesight. I was very <laughs> concerned about getting a bad grade. You're one of the first people I've ever heard of. That was their first kindergarten test. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, I think that's uh, something that's uh, indicative of uh, maybe my mindset over many years. But uh, <laughs> I wanted to not necessarily be the first to the top, but I wanted to be near the top somewhere. Sounds good. And uh, we moved to a different part of the city. I went to Fourth District, which was a, uh, uh, of course, through the seventh and the sixth grade, rather, it was the. Uh, uh, grammar school level and then uh, the arrangements here in the city were that as a junior high uh, you would, went either to uh, Holmes Junior High School which uh, was uh, on a campus uh, about a, two and a half miles from where I live uh -huh. or to another high school the junior high school called Carlisle John G. Carlisle High School I went to the Holmes High School uh, junior high school and uh, uh, was a, a very interesting experience in the sense that uh, the school still exists today and it's located on what amounts to a small campus. Uh, it's a, uh, the school itself will consist of three buildings, uh, a junior high school building, a senior high school building, and an administrative building. And it was called Holmes because it was built on the uh, the uh, land of a famous entrepreneur of probably the 1870s in uh, coming to the man named Holmes. Uh -huh. He became quite wealthy and he gave his estate to the uh, to the city, I guess. So at any rate, uh, for that reason, it's a campus. So my uh, perception until I left high school was that most high schools had this sort of uh, idyllic uh, tree <laughs> line type of campus where people went to get their high school diplomas. Okay. And uh, I graduated from the high, from Holmes High School in 1956. Uh -huh. and, uh, I was lucky in the sense uh, this uh, came out later. Uh, talking about teachers, there's no teacher per se that stood out. Uh, there were a few out, well, there were many outstanding teachers, but uh, uh, the luck that I had and many people of my generation had was that. Many of our teachers were people who would have been themselves college professors or senior engineers in major companies, uh -huh. but because of the Depression, they'd been caught uh, in the downturn of the 30s and had had to find or uh, look for employment where they could, and so they ended up being high school teachers. Okay. 
So they're well, edu well educated too. Huh? Well educated. Sure. Uh, the maturity factor was high because uh, most of the teachers that I had were at least 20 to 25 years older than I. So well, they were. Sure. I considered them to be very mature people. Oh yes, indeed. All right. Uh, I understand uh, from your uh, background information that I did, you went to the military academy. Yeah, that's true. Right. How did, I, that, uh, how did that come about? Did had you thought about that or? Right. Applied? Well, I I was actually uh, uh, after completing my high school diploma, I went to the University of Kentucky for a year. Uh huh. And uh, uh, in Lexington, my mother was a person who would always clip things out of the newspaper and. Uh, she sent me this clipping that said they were going to hold a, uh, an examination for appointment to the military academy at West Point. This was while I was in my fall semester first year at University of Kentucky. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, I decided I'd go and try and take the test. And uh, the, uh, uh, it required me, I was working actually in the dormitory cafeteria, so I had to get a time off at lunch because this test started at lunch and I took it and it mounted to a kind of an SAT type of test. Sure, okay. The framework uh, was that this was a test to, uh, for an appointment by the senator from Kentucky at that time whose name was Earl Clements. He'd been the previous governor. So I went down, took the test, uh, felt I had not done very well on it and sort of forgot about it. And then I returned home uh, from Lexington, Kentucky here to Covington and uh, I had a phone call from a local judge, <laughs> and I couldn't figure out why this judge would want to talk with me. Sure. And I went down to talk with the judge, uh, Judge Sheehan, and uh, he said, well, uh, it looks like Senator Clements is going to give you his uh, senatorial appointment to the military academy. And so uh, that was obviously a life-changing life event. I would think so, yes, <laughs> after so you recovered. Nowhere, I was suddenly uh, appointed to uh, and my first thought was this was too good to be true because potentially there was another problem or hurdle where it would be, uh, you know, come into play. Uh -huh. And I had to take an exam, uh, a physical exam and a sort of a PT type of exam at uh, Fort Knox in Kentucky. And so uh, the one thing I was concerned about was I had the misconception that you had to have 20-20 eyesight to get into the military academy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I knew that my, I didn't have 2020. And uh, so in order to try and prepare for this eye te test, I went to a, uh, I'm not even sure whether it's an optician or an optometrist. I assume it's an optometrist. And okay. Ask him how to approach this. And so he gave me some small cards to put on a desk at a certain distance and to work to try and reconcile the, the fuzziness of the letters uh, kind of interesting, it's a recall of the kindergarten problem, but uh, I never thought about that previously. But uh -huh. at any rate, uh, uh, I, I worked with these cards for a period of about a month and a half to get ready for this test. It turned out there was, it was irrelevant because uh, people with 2100 were admitted to the... Uh, oh. So that was not a problem. So yeah. I, passed, I passed the test. And, uh, then I encountered another interesting obstacle, and that was uh, just about a month before I was supposed to report to West Point, I uh, was in a car accident where I was a passenger, and I had to go to the hospital. I had a collapsed lung. Oh, dear. And it looked like, uh, you know, I, I would, and there might be a possibility that I wouldn't be able to uh, arrive. It was, uh, this was in uh, June, mid-June, it was, I had to report around the day after 4th of July, so... Ultimately, I reported everything went fine, but it was a little bit exciting before I actually got there. Sure. How did you get there? Did you take the train or? Uh, my dad drove me up. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. I'm coming up with my 50th reunion now. Go It'll ahead. be in May. Okay. May. And they asked us to do a uh, a kind of a uh, uh, bio sketch or something. Tell your life story in 450 words. <laughs> okay. And uh, so I, I pointed out that my dad, we stayed with an aunt, a great aunt who uh, was in New York City, and drove up. And then when uh, my dad said goodbye to me, I was fairly convinced he thought this would all be, you know, a false start, that he'd see me in a couple of weeks, come back to uh, coming to the, the life would go on as it normally would. 
but uh, it did work out that way. I actually graduated. Sure. Okay. How was it up there? Um, uh, did you uh, enjoy it? Well, yeah, it was interesting. Okay. I uh, the first uh, summer, is, it still is at the academies. They try and make life miserable and difficult. It's called Beast Barracks at West Point, and uh, they try to uh, take everything away from the, you as far as uh, uh, freedom of doing anything, and then give it back to you very slowly. But the idea is to sort of filter you out. So mm -hmm. life was pretty tough through the first yeah. three months at West Point. But then we got into academics, and it turned out that I, the sort of the light at the end of the tunnel started to flash on because I realized that uh, well, I graduated high my high school class, and I realized uh, that I was going to be able to do well in the uh, academic side of the, of the house. And uh, there is, at West Point, you're sort of evaluated on your, uh, well, ac academic performance you have to pass and get through the curriculum and so on, but also on what is called your aptitude which means are you a lantern-jawed uh, lantern uh, leader of men who, you know, could take people up the hill to charge sure. the machine gun position, uh -huh. uh, keep very shiny shoes, all that sort of thing. And uh, I, I was okay on aptitude, but I was very strong in the, in the, the academic realm. And one of the interesting stories when the light went on was uh, one of our first assignments was to write an essay actually oddly enough about our life you know one of these opening sure. english li literature types of uh, english uh, uh, three-page essay and so i i wrote this in the in english uh, all the instructors at west point at that time and still generally are uh, military officers okay so the captain in charge of our class after a week or so he came in he said to the entire class your your performance on this essay is absolutely miserable I'm, I'm just appalled at how poor all these uh, these essays are, with one exception. And then he started to read my little uh, blurb that I'd written. <laughs> and I, I got what amounted to a, uh, a maximum grade. A, uh, the normal grade point was, for Max was one, uh, one assignment would be a, a 3.0, uh -huh. but I got a 6.0 for two, a double assignment for this. So. Good, good wishes to you. That's great. Right away, I was, I knew suddenly I was going to be uh, in good shape in that <laughs> area, and then in some of the math areas as well. So, uh, okay. I bet I you had to, you did that by hand. No computer at that time, right? No, no word. Microsoft. What I did I, oh. actually, what uh, what I took along was an old portable uh, oh, type? uh, typewriter. Okay. Which, yeah. And I wrote this thing after taps. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to be up after taps. Sure. But I was sitting in a chair with the lights out in my room and with this old portable typewriter <laughs> uh, on my knees. And I typed <laughs> this thing out in uh, three pages and turned it in. Okay. <laughs> that was quite an adventure. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what was your major at uh, the military? Do, uh, do, 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 do you declare a major there as well? At that time, no. We oh. did. Uh, they have a, a now. It's uh, possible to declare a major, but okay. uh, at that time, you uh, my diploma reads a bachelor of science. Okay. And presumably, that was in uh, engineering, military engineering. Okay. Okay. All righty. Um, well, after that, then what uh, is that? When then you had to serve for a period of time. Is that after finishing at uh, graduating from the uh, academy? Right, I uh, there was a requirement at that time to serve a bit of a, I believe it was uh, three or four years, uh -huh. and I served for uh, six and a half years. But uh, I was uh, the next thing that happened was uh, I was assigned to a uh, branch school. When you graduate at that time, you were off, you had to make a selection of a military combat branch, which of there there were five choices in the army. That was the Infantry, artillery, uh, armor, Army Corps of Engineers, or the uh, Signal Corps. Okay. And I, uh, usually the people towards the top of the class were the ones where they were called high because they were high in rank. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they would take the engineers because, you know, they'd done well in their math and so on. I was 31st in my class. Okay, very good. So I was, was I took the Corps of Engineers and went to a, um, uh, branch school in Fort Belvoir, suburb of uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and they got my 
basic uh, officer training there, and then was assigned to Europe. Okay. And I'm taking a, a, a swallow of coffee sure. here. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I was assigned. Let me. Can to I interrupt? Let me interrupt one, one thing. Can tell us was uh, when you graduated? Was that one of the times when a, a president came and spoke with the, the speaker? Because they rotate around the academies. Actually, it was the vice president oh. who became a president. His name was Lyndon Baines Johnson. My goodness, that's in JFK days, right? Oh, right, that was, uh, Lyndon Baines was the vice president. Yeah, oh, that okay. was, uh, it must have been, yeah, and I think the fall convention had happened in 60. Uh-huh. We, right. uh, we, we marched in the inaugural parade for JFK. Oh, wonderful. On January the 20th of 1961, sure. and I graduated in June of 61. Right. It was a, uh, that was nice. quite a story, too. It was one of the coldest and snowiest inaugurals that ever occurred. And you marched in it. And I marched in it, right. <laughs> so Lyndon Baines at that time uh, was the vice president. Sure. And he came up, and I guess uh, JFK had decided to go to Annapolis and speak to them. Oh, okay, okay, all righty. Well, that's good. Okay, sorry, go ahead. So then you uh, went to Europe uh, with the Corps of Engineers? With the Corps of Engineers, and I was assigned... Uh, to a, uh, a battalion, the combat battalion, the 10th Engineers, uh, which was uh, mainly had its mission along the border between East and West Germany. And I was actually sent forward to a uh, forward position in a town called Bad Kissingen. And that was another life-changing experience because uh, this was a, a sort of an idyllic little town uh, out of a fairy tale. It was a spa city. And uh, it was uh, hard to describe if you've never been to Europe, but it's a place where people go to take the waters. And okay, it was a gorgeous sure. little kind of city. Right. And I met a, the most beautiful girl in the world for me there, who, who became my wife. Oh, how nice. Well, that worked out extremely well for you. <laughs> so that became uh, my first assignment. Then I was assigned to several other places in Europe, uh -huh. uh, Germany, and then came back to the U.S. to uh, be at the... Pittsburgh Engineer District, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, still uh, holds positions uh, in command of uh, officers sent to the various Army Corps of Engineer uh, districts around the country. Some of them are involved with the construction of dams, locks, and so on along the rivers. Mm -hmm. And some of them are involved with uh, both that and military construction at the various places like Fort Benning or uh, Fort Sill and so on. Okay. So I was there actually for a short time, uh, less than a year, and uh, I was assigned to Vietnam in uh, that time in 1965, and so I went to Vietnam, was there for a year and a half, uh, and then uh, uh, had it, I always told my classes that I had this very impressive all expenses paid vacation made by the <laughs> government to go to this tropical paradise. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, after being in the tropical paradise for a year and a half and uh, fighting the, the VC and mm -hmm. so on, I came back and uh, resigned and got out because I wanted to go uh, back and get an advanced degree, and it looked like that was not going to happen easily within the framework of the military. Sure, okay. What about uh, when uh, did you get married then after you got out of the service? or? No, I was oh. married. I got married when I was a, a oh, lieutenant. Okay. So uh, okay. I married in 1963 while I was still in by kissing it. Okay. And then my wife and I moved to several other locations, uh, Heilbronn and so on, in Germany. Uh -huh. And then uh, to Pittsburgh. And then when I went to Vietnam, of course, my wife returned to Germany and uh, lived there until I uh, I resigned. And then I, uh, because uh, I'm fluent in German, uh, and uh, I decided, uh, my wife was happy about this, that I would pursue a degree at the Technical University of Munich. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, I, I separated from the military in Germany and uh, went to, uh, uh, we moved to the city of Munich uh, for a year. I was there and uh, started to pursue my degree there. But as a kind of a backup system, I had contacted some of the universities in the U.S., including Purdue, oddly enough, Okay. Uh, to see what the opportunities would be for a uh, for graduate study, and uh, uh, I'd started a little graduate study while I was at Pittsburgh. I'd uh, taken some night courses at Carnegie Mellon University. At that time, it was called Carnegie Institute of Technology. Right. Yeah. 
So I, uh, I wrote the, uh, these uh, various universities just as a backup system, and uh, uh, a letter came back from the University of Illinois offering me an assistantship. Well, my wife, uh, I was away on a training exercise in the field with the reserves at that time, so my wife decided to play fate, which in German the word is schicksal, mm. and so she hid the letter. Oops, okay. And uh, so uh, she didn't say anything. I came back. I was going to my classes at the Technical University downtown in Munich, and then another letter came. And, of course, that letter said I had a, uh, a, a uh, scholarship. So putting the two letters together, an assistantship and a scholarship together, it looked like I would make more money studying at Illinois than I had made as a captain in the military. Okay, sounds good. We're moving on. <laughs> so uh, that was the another life-changing experience that uh, sort of moved me to study. To move, we moved back to Illinois to the Champaign-Urbana area, and I from seven, uh, 67 to uh, uh, seven, uh, 73, basically, I was studying uh, as a Ph.D. candidate, master's and Ph.D., and, of course, got my degree uh, in 1973, my doctorate. What was your uh, course, uh, what was your program, in what area, what discipline, engineering? I was uh, within the civil engineering okay. department, and the uh, area of emphasis was construction engineering, which mm -hmm. was, of course, the area that sure. I spent most of my life in. Right, okay, all right. And then uh, after that, what, just a little bit on the career path before you came to Purdue. Okay, after, after that, PhD. I, uh, when I graduated from Illinois, I, uh, ended, uh, I looked around. I received a position as an assistant professor at Georgia Tech. Okay. And spent uh, 12 years at Georgia Tech moving through the, the various ranks to full professor and head of the program there. Uh, then in the 19... Uh, Seventy-five. I had the opportunity to let's see. Is it seventy-five? No, it's uh, the 80, May eighty-five. 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 Right. I graduated in seventy-three. It would be eighty. Eighty-five. I had. Uh, I was actually uh, uh, on a uh, visiting professorship in Zurich, and I was offered a position as a chair professor at uh, at uh, University of Maryland in the D.C. area. So we moved to the D.C. area, lived there for two years, and then that was a chair professor in a ship. And then uh, the dean of engineering at Purdue at that time was uh, a gentleman named Henry Yang, sort uh -huh. of a legendary figure. And I always called him the Chinese Gorbachev because he was always able to juggle 16 different things at one time. <laughs> he was a regular buzzsaw. <laughs> and so he had decided that he was going to get me to come to Purdue. He, had you met him before, uh, before you before you came here? Uh, only no, oh, I, I okay. didn't know anything about him. Uh, okay. Except well, you said he, he decided. I wondered if we'd have some conversations or something. No, he mm -hmm. had decided that he wanted to get a person uh, in the area of construction at Purdue who okay. uh, had a uh, was considered to be eminent, had a, a worldwide reputation, and so uh, he had somehow. Uh, gone through a, a rather, this was his typical approach, he went through uh, literally maybe a, you know, 20 or 30 different experts to find out who was around and who would be the possible candidate. I, mean, I was the, in the crosshairs. Okay. And I, I, he contacted me and I said, I have really no interest. I just took this position as a chair professor at Maryland. And so he took the route of saying, well, have you ever been to Purdue? You should come out and give a lecture. We'd like to invite you to lecture, you know, here. And so it's hard to turn down a dean who asks you to come out and give a lecture. So I, I, I came out, and the long and the short of it was that uh, Henry, uh, we always said he made me the offer I could not refuse, mm. Okay. which was quite an offer because, of course, uh, I was already, uh, as a chair professor at Maryland, uh, from a salary point of view, I had a very good situation. Uh, I had a higher salary than the dean of engineering, and so it was uh, had to be. There were other issues involved, but I finally decided, okay, I'd accept the offer and go to Purdue. Okay. And here we are at Purdue, and you came as the division head for construction, engineering, and management. 
That's that's correct, right? right. Okay. When um, uh, when you came, whereabouts did you live? What was uh, housing was not a problem when you came though in those days. Earlier years, early years in the sixties and seventies was a little bit tight. Uh, uh, we we found a house that was uh, under construction was almost ready to be finished. Oh, okay. Uh, eight eight seventeen Lazy Lane in Lafayette, Indiana. Oh, okay. Good. Well, let's talk a little bit about the your headship and some of the and you also and also you became the Bowen head as well. For researchers, you might want to make a comment on that. Uh, right. Head. Well, uh, let's see. One of the things that you didn't know was, uh, I guess, uh, you Challenge. know, my my experience. Uh, what have I got here? Right. Test. Responsibilities, research, right. and challenges, right. and so on. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to start with the challenges because uh, one of the reasons Henry, uh, who's presently the chancellor of the University of California in Santa Barbara, he's been there since 1994, mm -hmm. uh, he had, to, he had a, a realized there was a problem in civil engineering, and it was that there was a lot of infighting and a lot of, uh, you know, confrontational things that were going on. And one of the things uh, was heavily involved with the area of construction because uh, the way things were set up, uh, construction was a division, which meant that they had actually had a, a budget and had various initiatives and prerogatives that it, no, none of the other people in the civil would have except the head of civil. Okay. So uh, de facto, it was a, a department and uh, I sat on the Dean's uh, Council, of course, as a head of this division. So mm -hmm. now that was uh, something that was not uh, all widely accepted throughout the old timers group in the civil engineering group. But there was also a big issue, and that was that uh, I was a uh, outsider, uh, an interloper. I was not a Purdue grad. And I was, uh, I think I was the first uh, full professor who was granted uh, full professorship with tenure as an outsider coming to Purdue Civil Engineering in the history of civil engineering. Hmm. Okay. So uh, uh, the, some of the challenges was to convince the faculty that I wasn't some kind of a, uh, you know, a diva who was going to come and sort of tromp all over Purdue, et cetera. And, 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 wasn't in the mold or wasn't in rhythm or in harmony with the mm -hmm. the, the perception or the, the precepts of being a, a boilermaker. So uh, also there was a, a great deal of enmity between the previous head of the construction uh, program, that is construction uh, division, and uh, some of the faculty on civil. So they, their uh, first attempt was to try and uh, have uh, the division sort of uh, merged with civil as a sub area right. and so that was on the table uh, and I one of my agreements with Dean Yang was uh, I'm not coming to Purdue to be part of a civil engineering department as a area I'm I, I'll either I get my own budget and so on or I'm, I'm not coming okay I already have that I mean I've had that so at any rate that that was established and then uh, effectively uh, for a long time uh, was a attempt to sort of undercut construction while uh, I started by using whatever methods were available and part of the methods uh, had to do with uh, trying to make sure I could not get any tenured professors in my program because of course tenure still resided within civil engineering so one of the challenges I had was bringing in new faculty who were so impressive that they would be tenured uh, and that ultimately worked, and uh, we ultimately got things organized so that construction was uh, given some high, higher level of recognition. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, I guess you could say, the, uh, the squirrel swallowed the alligator in the sense that I became the interim head of civil. Okay. So suddenly I was, you know, uh, it took a long time. I, I wasn't suddenly, it took uh, 13 years and then uh, things had uh, become uh, more harmonious, and uh, but that was that was a, a very big challenge. It was well, the I'd it, say so. Yeah. That was something that I had to deal with, and uh, ultimately, I think uh, the bottom line now is we have a, uh, a faculty in the uh, division of construction who uh, also hold appointments in civil. Mm -hmm. It's a very young, vibrant, and very productive. Uh, 
faculty, so uh, that's the end of the story is uh, right. everybody uh, happy ending. Good. Um, could you make, uh, on your research, your the development of that cyclone simulation system, would you comment on that, sir? Right. Well, uh, one of the, I started with the cyclone system back as my Ph.D. thesis when I finished at Illinois. Uh-huh. And, and so uh, while I was at uh, Georgia Tech and at uh, Maryland, uh, this had been uh, uh, morphing and growing into a area which uh, defines part of the research that could be done now by construction engineering uh, PhDs and so on. And it focused on an area that had not been uh, normal in the past. That was the use of simulation to uh, study the uh, operations on a construction site, like the trucks that are loaded or the cranes that are lifting uh, loads or the uh, placement of concrete or the tunneling of tunnels and stuff like that. Sure. And it's done by a mathematical simulation. And uh, it's now... Uh, within the uh, scholarly community, if you look at the publications in the various journals, it represents about 15 to 20, maybe even 25 percent of the papers that are published uh, in scholarly journals, the simulation of various aspects of construction. So mm -hmm. uh, when I came to, uh, to Purdue, it was obvious that I would carry this research forward, which we did, uh -huh. and uh, I had 23 uh, PhDs who graduated while I was at Purdue, and uh, probably about 18, 50 to 18 of them worked in the area of construction simulation with something uh, related to cyclone. Very good. Very. That's nice to hear. Um, in your in the division, how about the enrollment? Did it increase uh, both undergrad and graduate? Yes, it did. Okay. Uh, when I came, the under, uh, the undergraduate was strong. Uh, it actually increased uh, okay. from about uh, graduating uh, 20. Eight to thirty uh, students each uh, year. We you know, went up to fifty at one time and mm -hmm. back to around forty. So that that actually expanded. But also, the graduate program was somewhat uneven when I got there, and uh, of course that became a real uh, um, uh, uh, juggernaut in the sense that we moved from being just an average graduate program to being one of the premier graduate schools programs in construction in the world, basically. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, as I said, 23 of my, 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 I had 23 PhDs, but there are over 50, 60, maybe even 70 PhDs have graduated since I arrived in 87. Wow. That's which pretty dominates good. the, which dominates the faculty part picture in construction engineering throughout the U.S. Yeah. Well, it's very nice to hear that. What about um, diversity in uh, the school? Well, when I got there, uh, we, uh, we just had a, a sort of a standard group of uh, male. We did have a couple of international people. Uh -huh. uh, then I um, hired, we only had a faculty, the total faculty, even when I uh, resigned, when I retired rather, it was uh, about eight. Oh, okay. But I, uh, I hired Dulcie Abraham, who was a student I'd had while I was at Maryland. And Dulcie uh, came in, uh, she, uh, she became, uh, well, she's now a, a full professor with tenure and is a dominant force in, in, in many ways, very active within this College of Engineering and so on. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, were lucky to get one of my former PhD, uh, had a PhD at North Carolina State, uh, uh, who was an African American, uh, Phil Dunstan. And uh, Philip uh, had completed his PhD at NC State, who was at Washington, University of Washington as a faculty member, but we were able to convince Phil to come and uh, uh, join our faculty. So out of the eight, we had an African-American and a uh, uh, and Dulcie, of course, uh, a woman on the faculty who, at that time, I think, in the, when Dulcie came on the faculty, the entire number of women in engineering, there were, uh, I think, about 250 faculty oh. or something like that. There were only about four, six, eight, somewhere around right there. Hmm. Uh, and when Philip uh, joined the uh, faculty, there were probably only two other uh, African-American mm -hmm. faculty. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, in terms of uh, diversity, uh, we, uh, we were pretty, pretty diverse, right. I guess you could say. I would say so, right, yeah. How about advancement and development uh, during the time that you were here for the, your division and the school? Well, we, 
We put together uh, funding for a number of, well, quite a number of, of scholarships and for uh, uh, some support of laboratories and named laboratories and so on. Sure. And uh, we, uh, of course, were fortunate in the sense that uh, from the bricks and mortar point of view, we, uh, when I arrived, we had moved into a new uh, portion of the uh, civil engineering building. Oh, I was going to ask you if you were in the new facility, the extension to the building. Okay. Right. We moved into that. So we had uh, a, a, a pretty nice uh, facility in that sense. And uh, we, we did receive a lot of uh, support from uh, uh, industry within the state of Indiana. The fact that I was the Bowen chair was uh, due to uh, gifts from uh, Bob Bowen, who uh, is the founder of Bowen Engineering in Indianapolis. Uh huh. But then uh, we, we actually helped uh, support some of the uh, other divisions or other activities in civil engineering, the uh, large structural engineering laboratory, uh, which is also called the Bowen Laboratory. Uh, it's about 50,000 square feet. Is that uh, the one that's out on, um, the old two, on 231 out there, South River Road? That's they right, yeah. Okay. The, the Bowen Engineering, because of our good, uh, good rapport with Bob, Bob uh, Bowen, uh, he provided the, the key grants to get the uh, Bowen Laboratory uh, totally funded so that they could begin construction. Sure, right. So I, I have to say that we, that actually partially happened while I was interim head of the civil school. So those were the advancement things that uh, Very good. obviously were good from the perspective of all disciplines in civil. Right. Let me ask you again, on the Bowen head, was that uh, like a chaired? Professor, is that was that right? Yeah, okay. it was a it was a professorship which carries with it a uh, a, a certain funding amount oh, so okay. for funding research and things of that nature. Okay, sounds good. Uh, were you were you a faculty fellow while you were here, sir? And no, they uh, they had that program, but I was already a head of department, so I was not uh, okay. not a, a, a okay. candidate for faculty fellow. Okay, what about family? Can I talk a little about that? Um, did you have children? Did it, and if so, did they come to Purdue or? I have uh, one. Uh, my son lives in Billings, Montana, and uh, he and his wife Terry. Uh, my son's name is, is Reiner, which is a German name, of course. Uh, we uh, he goes by Ryan, uh, the uh, R Y A N. Uh huh. But Terry and Reiner uh, live in uh, Billings, Montana. We have uh, three uh, grandsons. Uh, Twenty. Let's see. Twenty-eight, twenty-six, twenty-five. Mm -hmm. I think it is right now. Their okay. ages. Okay. Yeah, two great grandchildren. So uh, my wife, as I said, uh, was a uh, native of Germany. Sure. Uh, she was uh, uh, the most uh, e extraordinary person I ever met. And she she passed away last year. But, uh, oh dear. We, we had forty eight wonderful years together. And uh, so my son and uh, daughter-in-law are out in Montana. And, uh, so that from that perspective, I, I get a lot of travel back and forth sure. to the West. That sounds good. Okay. Um, C2, that Engineering Construction Research Institute, could you make a comment on that? Is, uh, that, is that something you were involved in, the C2 Emerging Technologies website or something? Were you involved in that or not? Uh, yes, oh. right. The uh, Emerging Technologies website okay. uh, was uh, – based on a grant that I received from the Construction Industry Institute, okay. the people who award the Dunn Prize, the Dunn Award. And uh, well, that was uh, designed to try and uh, identify and help disseminate information about uh, new breakthrough types of technology in construction. Well, we, we did some analysis first, and then the decision was made the best way to get a lot of this information out was to start a, uh, a website, which would be the Emerging Technologies website. Okay. And uh, that was uh, something that we had in place uh, through the last four or five years of my time at, uh, uh, as head of the uh, division. And then uh, Macron Hostock, who is the head of the division now, right. one of my PhD students, he, uh, he's taken that over and uh, sort of moved it, ramped it up to an even higher level. Okay. And uh, so I think it's uh, well, well recognized throughout the world. A lot of people go to it to look for new ideas and new technologies. And uh, in that respect, it's uh, also a wonderful uh, advertisement for Purdue because uh, from European, uh, Asian perspectives, uh, Purdue, uh, the website is viewed as sort of a uh, 
crossroads for information, and therefore, since the university does this, it must be a pretty important university. Sounds good, and it is. <laughs> right. uh, awards and honors. A couple. We got quite quite a few. That uh, Perfroy Construction Research Award from the American Society of Civil Engineers. That's very nice. Yeah, that's the highest uh, it is. That's construction right. related uh, award that the American Society of Civil Engineers gives. So it's the elite sort of uh, group of uh, people over the years. Uh, the man, Purefoy himself, was uh, the founder of one of the very first uh, undergraduate programs uh, in the United States. And uh, that was at Texas a and He uh, wrote several textbooks, which are sort of seminal or basic texts over the years. And so the ASCE, the American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, funded the Purefoy Award to recognize the most preeminent uh, researchers uh, in, in construction, and uh, actually uh, most of them have been from the U.S., but some, we have uh, one or two Canadians, you know, we have two Canadians who have been recognized. So uh, at any rate, it's the uh, uh, preeminent uh, award for the American Society of Civil Engineers to construction types of researchers and academics. All right, that's very nice. You also re received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from University of Illinois from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Well, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's personally nice. very prestigious from my perspective because uh, when I received the uh, grant, uh, that is the uh, scholarship and, uh, and assistantship from Illinois, it was, I, I always called it the, uh, the New England <coughs> flowering of civil engineers. The greatest civil engineers at that time were all members of faculty at Illinois. Okay. The head of the department was a man named Newmark, who uh, was effectively, from the computer point of view, the George Washington of civil engineering computing. Okay. And uh, the the entire faculty was a panoply of uh, world famous people in all the disciplines of uh, of the civil engineering. In fact, one of the things that was interesting was the uh, the size of the civil engineering faculty at Illinois at that time was 105 tenured professors. Wow. Uh, I've never there's not any other uh, engineering department I I know of of any size electrical mechanical whatever. Good uh, lord! Where I had 105 tenured professors. <laughs> it was actually at the time was bigger than about 87% uh, of the entire engineering schools in the United States in I terms would, of ten, tenured faculty. Yeah, I would think so. That's right, yeah. So all the heroes, all the, the greats were, were there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that would, uh, obviously had an important effect because the students who would graduate from there obviously were already in a network that was uh, made them well, very well connected. Sure, that's right. A couple of other ones that you got was the... Um, uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Construction Section in INFORMS College of Simulation. Right, right. That's uh, the, uh, the preeminent group uh, in, in the operations research activities is INFORMS, and they, uh, there is a construction division within that, and uh, I was uh, given a special award by that division for my uh, work as the, effectively the founder of simulation in the construction area. Oh, okay. All righty. And, uh, and you have honorary membership in your American Society of Civil Engineering. Yeah, actually, uh, distinguished. It's, it's now been converted from honorary to being a distinguished member of... Okay. Uh, so uh, that, that is, of course, the top honor that ASCE can give to anybody. That's their highest award. And uh, I think the membership of the ASCE is around 180,000 now, and I think there are on the order of 100 of these distinguished honorary distinguished members right now so okay. it's the tip of the iceberg as far as uh, recognition by your your own professional organization right which is really nice and are you still you, uh, are you still keep uh, active in the american the, in your professional association such as the american society of civil engineering uh yes right okay. i i uh, try to uh, there are actually three uh, four groups that i try to stay uh, involved with and go to their annual meetings one is the ASCE annual meeting and the award of the uh, distinguished membership to uh, there's a special banquet for that i try to go to that each year mm -hmm. the other one is the construction industry institute where i have the dunn award i try to go to their meeting each year which is in august and, uh, and then the uh, there's a another uh, group 
which is a, an elite group called the National Academy of Construction, NAC. Mm -hmm. And I was just at their meeting in New York City in uh, October. Okay. And uh, then, if possible, I try to go to the Winter Simulation Conference of the uh, Infarms group. So I, I try and attend all of those. I also uh, end up being involved with certain uh, special meetings. There was a uh, National Science Foundation the sponsored meeting at Virginia Tech just uh, the end of September, and I was invited to be there as, a, uh, as an invited attendee and so on. Oh, good. That's good to keep active in the associations. They also, appreciate the input. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess in that sense, in retirement, one of my activities I'm trying to stay busy with is updating my textbooks. Okay. All right. I was going to ask you about retirement activities. Okay. Well, I'll let you go ahead and ask. Oh, this. go ahead. What what sort of activities in retirement? Well, How did you, I, des uh, you decided to return to Kentucky? I gather. Well, that's right. I sure. uh, I decided to. Uh, my wife and I made that decision jointly, and uh, we made uh, the decision based on the fact that we wanted to be somewhere uh, where we were close to a larger city uh, for a number of reasons, and our options were to. Uh, go to uh, back here to Cincinnati where I have family and uh, high school friends and so on, or go to Atlanta where I, we had a lot of friends from our time at Georgia Tech, mm -hmm. or go to Billings, Montana where our son and daughter-in-law are located, or go back to Germany, which was, of course, not really feasible from the point of view of health care because uh, we would be able to have access to Medicare and that kind of support. They are at the same level that we would if uh, you know if we were in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we uh, we finally came here to uh, Northern Kentucky, and uh, uh, it's uh, worked out well in the sense that I do have a large circle of friends and relatives who I'm able to uh, stay in contact with, and uh, even more so, it's more of a critical situation now since my wife passed away last year. Sure, that's right. And it's, you got the and Cincinnati's a nice, is close for you. It's a nice, good sit. A lot of activities going on there too. Well, we have uh, the most, uh, I, I guess, the best situation you could possibly have. The uh, we have a uh, we bought a beautiful house which is on a golf course, but it's only about 12 minutes from the uh, CBG Airport, which is the Cincinnati huh. Airport. Okay. In about 15 minutes from downtown Cincinnati, and yet we're sitting in a park park like area. It's totally green. Wow, that is the best. Very good. <laughs> and the hospital uh, we can see from the front door, so that's another obvious <laughs> Sound, for, for retirees. Sounds good. Um, do you have an outstanding event that you'd like to share with us? Uh, an outstanding event. event. Yeah. Anything special comes to mind? Well, of course, all the awards that okay. I've received are, uh, uh, you know, that's probably the, the most gratifying part of life is to be recognized by your peers. That's right. That's right. And, uh, I agree. Effectively, the awards that I've received are sort of like the triple crown of construction civil engineering. Uh, on steroids because uh, it goes beyond being a triple crown it's a quadruple quintuple crown and that's uh, you know the thing that you hope for in life is to uh, uh, do uh, well and to hold to your commitments and uh, hopefully other people will profit and uh, you know uh, uh, effectively uh, be able to access the line of thinking you have, but also will profit from your having worked and done things. And uh, right. these awards uh, sort of uh, validate that uh, fact that uh, I've, I've had a good and uh, positive effect. The other thing it's very gratifying to me is the fact that uh, uh, I've published a, a seven, eight books with Wiley and several other companies uh, on the order of 11 books. And these books are worldwide. They've been translated into Chinese and Portuguese and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that I uh, I uh, had the uh, opportunity to write the books, but th this is uh, a link. You know, you're reaching out and touching students throughout the world. Effectively, and these books are still active. We just uh, I just completed the fourth edition of uh, the basic book that I wrote, uh -huh. and so uh, this this goes on. It lives on. It, but there's so many you know, great events. Uh, the time that we spent in Zurich at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, my wife and I, that was a, a fantastic. 
My life has been full of uh, events that you can only read about in the in the novels. Basically, I, nobody I could have never. Uh, my wife on the street thought where I would end up, the places I would go. I'm going to switch to a different telephone. This one is starting to. Beep. Okay. All right. <coughs> Hello? Yeah, are you okay? Can you hear me? Right, I just turned off the one I had. All right, okay. This one mobile unit uh, doesn't uh, hold a charge very long. Okay. Uh, I think in cl uh, closing, um, anything on a uh, view on construction, en uh, construction, or your engineering construction management, say from an academe in today? Comment well, on that? Yeah, I think that uh, the uh, construction management is uh, the future of. Uh, there's certainly a lot of the aspects of civil engineering with you. And civil engineering itself is uh, sort of uh, broken into individual disciplines more than maybe some other uh, engineering dis disciplines. For instance, we have uh, structural design, the environmental, and the geotechnical, and uh, wastewater, and sort of these things. Uh, what the fact of the matter is, although uh, many of the students will, will get their degrees with these specialties, as they rise in rank in their in their areas, they have to deal with management. They have to make management decisions, they have to plan things, they have to uh, schedule things, they have to do cost estimates, all this sort of thing. Right. And so, uh, in effect, uh, much of the sort of uh, calculational aspects of this is being taken care of by computers or by engineers working in Bangalore or in uh, Taiwan or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, the, uh, there was some resistance in the civil engineering community about construction engineering not being uh, numerical enough and so on. But actually what's happened now, and this is a worldwide phenomenon, is that uh, more and more of the future lies with having a, a good and uh, workable relationship with construction management if you're in civil engineering. And uh, even if you're a mechanical or chemical engineering, uh, for instance, uh, my wife's family, uh, some of the... Uh, Cousins and nephews are uh, have degrees in Germany, and a large part of their curriculum now is shifted to management topics as well as the technical topics. Okay, all right. So, uh, in effect, uh, I think that uh, construction management, first of all, has turned the corner. There was a great deal of resistance back in '87 when I came to Purdue. Uh huh. Uh, now, uh, I always say that uh, construction management has uh, one. And uh, its position at the table, you know, with the sure. other mechanical, electrical, uh, chemical, and so on, that we have uh, the same level of visibility now that these disciplines have. Whereas back in the early 80s and so on, it was still, uh, we were considered to be the new guys on the block, and, you know, construction okay. engineering as a discipline was, didn't have the same uh, prestige and so on that it does now. Okay, well that, sound, that sounds good, and certainly your contributions and others have really made that come to come to uh, fruition. Uh, Professor Halpin, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been wonderful talking to you. We will send you a draft transcript, but it might be a little bit of time before we send it to you, okay? Well, that would be excellent, though. I'd like okay. to get that. And then you can take a look at it, and be, because we don't put anything on our website until the review, the draft transcript has been reviewed by the interviewee, so not to be concerned. Okay, okay that's fine. And, and uh, you have a very nice holiday, and uh, thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to chat with you. Okay, Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat>